In this video, we're going to take a look at multi-step synthetic approaches for lengthening and shortening sugars. So it's going to be an opportunity to practice what we've learned about the reactions of carbohydrates and the functional groups within alcohols and carbonyls. These methods had some historical importance for elucidating the stereochemistry of the various monosaccharides. For our purposes, we're mainly going to use them as a means to deepen our understanding of and appreciation for the reactions of carbohydrates. Let's start with the idea of lengthening a monosaccharide. So imagine we started, for example, with a four-carbon tetrose, and we wanted to lengthen it out to a pentose, like ribose. What we need to do here, essentially, is add one more carbon on the end of the chain and get that carbon in the aldehyde oxidation state if it doesn't come in that way. And the brilliant insight of Fisher and Kiliani here was that we can achieve this through nucleophilic addition of cyanide followed by a partial reduction of the cyanide to an aldehyde group. So the fischer kiliani synthesis is sort of a, a two-stage process with three steps overall. In the first stage, we add HCN. We hydrocyanate uh, the starting aldose, essentially. And the idea here is that cyanide brings in our new carbon, brings in the new carbon one. So I've, here I've numbered the carbons based on the pentose numbering in the product, and we can see how that cyanide carbon becomes the new carbon number one in the product of this hydrocyanation or this nucleophilic addition reaction. So this is nothing more than adding the elements of hydrogen cyanide across the CO double bond. It's a hydrocyanation reaction, which we've seen previously. Now, this sets a new stereocenter at carbon 2. And that stereocenter could have one of two possible configurations. So this step is going to give a mixture of epimers. For our purposes, you can always assume that the epimers are separable. They're always going to be diastereomers, and so at least theoretically, we're always able to separate them and we can carry one on or carry the other on as desired. But this uh, nucleophilic addition step will give a mixture of epimers, and that's worth noting. What do we do now? Well, we've added the carbon we need to the end of the chain, but the CN triple bond is not in the right oxidation level, right? This is currently the plus three oxidation level. We need to get it down to an aldehyde oxidation level to produce the final aldose. And that is the goal of the second stage. What we need is a reduction, right? Essentially, essentially from something like plus three to plus two or plus one, depending on how you count the hydrogen. And so something like H2 comes to mind as a reducing agent. But if we just use H2 and platinum palladium, there's a good chance that the nitrile will be reduced all the way to an amine, all the way to a CH2, NH2. And that is not what we want. So instead, we make use of a poisoned, quote unquote, palladium catalyst with palladium and barium sulfate. This is actually reminiscent of the Lindlar hydrogenation of alkynes to cis alkenes, which you may have seen previously. This establishes an imine, which is then hydrolyzed to an aldehyde via the addition of water in the third step there. And the ultimate result is the conversion of that nitrile group into an aldehyde group. And again here, we end up with two epimers. In this particular case, where we start with D3-ose, we end up with the pentoses, D-ribose, and D-arabinose. So this is the fischer kiliani synthesis. And of course, we can iterate this, right? We can now do this all over again with another round of HCN, H2, and palladium uh, and barium sulfate, and then H2O. And this would convert these pentoses into hexoses, and so on, and so on, and so forth. What if we had a pentose in hand, say we had a sample of D-ribose, and we wanted to degrade it back down to D-3-ose or even D-glyceraldehyde? Well, then we'd need to make use of some kind of degradation synthetic approach, and the basic idea, if we look at the fischer kiliani synthesis, in a way, is to kind of run these reactions in reverse. If we could oxidize the aldehyde back up to a nitrile, and then take advantage of the fact that hydrocyanation is reversible, it is possible to reverse this and eliminate HCN from these um, cyanohydrins, we could get back to a monosaccharide that has one fewer carbon than where we started. And one synthetic approach that essentially tries to achieve this is known as the Wohl degradation. 
and it's the shortening of an aldose by one carbon. So just like the fischer kiliani synthesis, where we can iterate and add one carbon at a time, we can use the wool degradation to take off one carbon at a time. And it's, it's rather cleverly constructed to be the reverse or the exact opposite of the fischer kiliani approach. So the idea is we're going to first establish a CN double bond with a leaving group attached to the nitrogen. With this aldehyde, former aldehyde H here, and this OAC group here, we've got a leaving group and an H poised to eliminate. And that's going to establish a CN triple bond. And we see that here. And then we can use here, for example, alkoxide base, sodium alkoxide and methanol to hydrolyze this OAC group and ultimately reveal the aldose. So this is the idea from a big picture point of view of the wool degradation. We're gonna set up this acylated oxime. We're gonna eliminate it to get back to something that resembles the cyanohydrin with an acyl group where the OH would be. We're gonna hydrolyze that and this will eliminate HCN at the same time and get us back to the monosaccharide with one fewer carbon than where we started. Notice here, we're starting with a hexose, D-glucose, and we're ending with arabinose, which is a pentose, only five carbons. Okay, so let's dig into the details here. In the first step, we treat with NH2OH. This is going to condense with the aldehyde group to create an oxime. This is the structure of an oxime, and the idea here is essentially analogous to imine formation. We're creating a CN double bond and eliminating water. That oxime is then acylated with acetic anhydride and sodium acetate. This installs an acyl group on this sort of hanging OH, but these conditions will also acylate all the other OHs in the molecule, and that's why we see all of those AC groups in this product right here. Now, the acetate is there to facilitate this elimination elimination of acetic acid from this acetylated oxime intermediate. And this electron flow establishes the CN triple bond down here. If that's difficult to see, it's worth pausing the video and kind of following the electron flow here. So now we're at the acetylated cyanohydrin, and the purpose of the last step is to hydrolyze all of those acetyl groups off, sort of re-unveiling the OH groups and eliminating off HCN. And so the idea here is we get back to the cyanohydrin, and then the base eliminates H plus and CN minus from the cyanohydrin, and we've arrived back at the pentose in this case. And of course now we can iterate this process. If we wanted to go down to a tetrose, we could start with diarabinose, treat with hydroxylamine and acetic anhydride, sodium acetate, and then finally use strong, relatively strong alkoxide base to hydrolyze those acetyl groups off and eliminate HCN getting down to the tetrose. So the wool degradation is a way to take any aldose monosaccharide and degrade it ultimately all the way back down to glyceraldehyde. The method sort of breaks down when you get to glyceraldehyde because you're sort of out of carbons, right? Um, but this allows us uh, a means to essentially chop off carbons off a monosaccharide one carbon at a time, starting at the aldehyde carbon, carbon one, and working our way down with each iteration.